my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. I think we have a great show for you today. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. I have an incredible creation scientist with me today. His name is Dr. Jason Lyle. He is an astrophysicist with a PhD from the University of Colorado. Jason, it's a great privilege to have you here today. Well, thanks for having me on. Now, we're going to talk about ultimate proof. Uh, what, what's that all about? Well, basically, I believe that there is an argument for biblical creation, the Bible in general, that is so powerful that there is no refutation to it. Wow, so we don't have to have a second show for people who want to answer this. This is going to settle it. I believe it will, yes. All right. Well, first of all, I want to point out that this is a proof. It's not persuasion. Sometimes people are not persuaded even by a very good argument. That doesn't okay. mean that's, that there's necessarily anything wrong with the argument. It could mean that there's something wrong with people. Okay. And we know that people are not always rational. And we should remember, too, as Christians, that even if we give this great argument for the faith, unless the Holy Spirit works on that person, they're not going to be able to understand the argument. They won't be persuaded. It's our job to make a defense. It's God's uh, prerogative to bring uh, persuasion. What I'd like to do is I'd like to start with some scientific evidence that people often use, and I'll show you that this is good stuff, but you know, it falls short of an, of an ultimate proof. Uh, we have, for example, DNA, and it's, it's ironic that the discoverers of DNA were atheists, and they thought when they found DNA, oh, we've disproved God, and it turns out DNA is one of the most marvelous evidences, I think, for God, one of them. Oh, it sure is. I mean, God encoded all the instructions to make us on a molecule. I mean, we put something on a Blu-ray, we think we're so clever, God puts it on a molecule. It's think incredible, it. yeah. And so all these instructions are there. Now it's interesting because these instructions cannot come about by chance. You see, DNA has this information in it, and it turns out that that never comes about by chance. In fact, uh, Dr. Elise Bettner says all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. And so the idea that, that, that DNA could evolve by mutations and natural selection, it's not possible because it's in the wrong direction to make evolution happen. And if, if information can't come from mutation, then someone had to originally plant the information. That's right. The laws of information science tell us that information always originates in a mind. And so you see that's consistent with biblical creation. It sure is. Now, mutations might have survival value under certain circumstances. That can happen, but not by adding brand new information. Indeed, Dr. Spetner says not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. And so when we study genetics, we find it's very consistent with what God has said in his word. It's not consistent with what evolutionists would expect. No. But we can also move to the realm of outer space. That's my uh, area of uh, expertise. And I want to talk about comets, for example. Now, uh, comets, of course, they're made up of ice and dirt. And they have, uh, they have tails. And they follow these uh, very eccentric orbits that they swing out. And they're hard to predict for that reason. They're, they're motions in the night sky because they're not always in the plane of the solar system. In fact, it's been said that comets are a lot like cats. They have tails and they do what they want. They sort of uh, have these erratic paths out there. But whenever you see a comet's tail, that means that comet is getting smaller. It's losing mass. And it's been estimated that a typical comet can last for no more than about 100,000 years. After that, it's running out of material because the sun's blasting away that, that uh, material into space. And so we know comets just don't last that long. And so you see, that's an evidence of a young solar system, I believe, that it's thousands, not millions or billions of years old. And it may seem, of course, I could list all kinds of lines of evidence like that. And it may seem that, that those refute evolution, and they refute the long ages, but they really don't. They don't prove creation. And the reason for that is for each one of these lines of evidence, an evolutionist can always invoke what we might call a rescuing device. He can come up with a hypothesis or a story that saves his worldview from what, what seems to be contrary evidence. And so in the case of comets, my secular colleagues, they, they know, that they, you know that they don't last very long. And so they say, well, there must be this Oort cloud that generates new comets, a big comet generator that throws new ones in as the old ones disintegrate. Now, if I were to ask uh, one of my secular colleagues, do you have any observational evidence of an Oort cloud? If he's honest, he'll say, I will know. But if he's clever, he'll say, but you can't prove it's not there. <laughs> and that's true, I can't. But that's arguing from, from nothing is not a very good argument. That's right, it's not. But, but he is technically right. I can't sure. disprove an Oort no, cloud. And for that reason, yeah. comets don't prove a young solar system, because there that's could right. be an Oort cloud. I don't believe there that's is. Right. But there could be, hypothetically. Or, you know, even the information in DNA, you could say, well, there's some unknown process that generates that information. We just, you know, give us time, we'll find it, right? And so for that reason, we need a different kind of argument if we're going to actually prove biblical creation. Okay. And so we need an argument for our worldview to prove that my way of looking at the evidence is the right way of looking at the evidence. You see, we all have, these, we all have the same facts. We all have the same science. I mean, we, we really have the same evidence. It's not like there's evidence for creation and evidence for evolution. We all have the same evidence. It's how you look at it. We have different 
different glasses, as it were, different worldviews. And you can think of that like mental glasses. Like I like to think of the Bible like prescription lenses that are designed just for you. You put them on, the world snaps into focus, you see things as they are. I think of evolution like red glasses. You put on red glasses, you see red everywhere. It's not that the world is red but your view has been colored by the glasses you're wearing. I like that. The, the, the God's word makes us see reality, I believe. That's right. God's, and, God's got the correct view of history. And if you're looking through a lie, you're never going to see the truth. Certainly. Now I realize evolutionists would swap that and say, we got the right glasses. Yes. We're going right. to have to make that argument. But my point here is that we all have these worldviews, which consist of presuppositions. And so that's just uh, technical jargon for your most basic convictions about reality. What you hold to be true very dearly. You, there are things you already believe before you come to, to, to the evidence. If you come by a rock on the side of the road, you say, well, I think I'm going to do an experiment on that rock. You already believe that your senses are reliable because uh, you see the rock and you, you don't say, well, I see a rock, but there probably isn't a rock there. It's probably my eyes just tricking me again. I mean, pr presumably you say, my senses are reliable most of the time at least. And so that's an example of a presupposition. Now that makes sense in the Christian worldview, but it's something that you assume before you look at the evidence. And so, um, and there are lots of things like that. Now some people might say, oh no, not me. I come to the evidence with a blank slate. I'm neutral. But the fact is, the belief that you should come to the evidence neutrally is itself a belief about sure. how you should come to the evidence. Or the philosophy that we should come to evidence with no philosophy is a philosophy. And very few people are as neutral as they think they are. Oh, that's right. In fact, the Bible tells us there's really no absolute neutral when it comes yeah. to an ultimate faith commitment. Now, see, the point here is that creationists and evolutionists have competing worldviews. We have different sets of presuppositions. That's what the debate is really about. It's really not about evidence. That surprises people. It's about how we should interpret evidence. And see, the creationist is looking at the evidence through the perspective that God's word, the Bible, is the ultimate standard. That's what we should be doing anyway. Now, the evolutionist, well, there are different types of evolutionists out there, but often they will appeal to naturalism, which is the belief that nature is all that there is, or strict empiricism, which is the belief that all truth claims are answered observationally. Yeah, if you want to know something, go out and look at it and taste it and touch it and smell it, whatever. Okay, and so if you have that kind of worldview, that disallows God, and you're going to have to think about things that way. Now, evidence by itself is never decisive when it comes to a worldview issue. And, so, and that's where a lot of people run into trouble. They think, well, if I just had enough evidence, yes. I could convince my opponent. You can't. And see, the reason for that, you might, you might have this great evidence that the Bible's true. I do think that fossils are fantastic evidence of a worldwide flood. They make sense. But that's because I'm looking at it through the lens of Scripture. I'm looking at it properly through the lens of Scripture. My secular colleague, he's going to look at that same evidence. He's going to say, that's not how I see it. He's going to have a rescuing device. He says, no, I think fossils are laid down over millions of years. And slowly, and this proves old earth and so on. And you know what we're inclined to say? We're inclined to say, well, maybe that's not such a good evidence then, because it didn't convince him. Well, that's not the case. It's perfectly good evidence. He's just looking at it wrong. Yeah. And so we come up with a different evidence. Well, how about now? What about the canyons? They can form quickly. And he says, well, yeah, that one did, but that doesn't mean they all do. And we say, well, rock layers can be laid down quickly. You know, Mount St. Helens proved that. He says, well, just because those rocks were laid down quickly doesn't mean that these rocks were laid down quickly. And, oh, but animals reproduce according to their kinds. He says, well, given enough time, one kind will change into another, and so on. And, you know, DNA, it's got information. He says, give us enough time. We'll find a secular mechanism for that. Well, but there's comets. He says, no problem. There's an Oort cloud. Right? So whatever evidence you present, if you've got a clever person, he's going to be able to come up with a rescuing device for that. And because to add insult to injury... they're not going to lay down their presuppositions. That's right. You, you, you hold to those tightly. And to add insult to injury, he's going to say, oh no, you're the one with the wrong interpretation. You're the one with the rescuing devices, you see. Yeah. Now, it's, it's not wrong to show people evidence. We should, I think we should do some of that. For, for, one, for one thing, most people have been so trained to look at the evidence from this perspective that they can't even consider the possibility that there is another way to look at it. And so I think we do need to, to tell them that hey, there is a biblical way of looking at things like comets and things like that. You don't really need an Oort cloud in that view. And so, uh, although it's fine to show people evidence, that by itself, it's not going to persuade them, nor should it, because you haven't made an argument for my worldview. And so what I want to do today is say, how do we then argue for a worldview? How do I show that my presuppositions, my worldview is the right way of looking at the evidence, and his is the wrong way of looking at the evidence? And you can't do that just by using the evidence, because that's not what it's about. It's about how we should look at it. And so how do I convince my secular colleague, knowing that I can't really convince him, it's got to be the Holy Spirit, but can I make a good argument for my worldview? And I think I can. Because you see, the Bible tells us that all wisdom comes from God. All knowledge comes from God. The Bible makes that very clear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, which means if you're going to even start to know anything, you have to start with biblical presuppositions, Christian presuppositions. Amen. 
And of course, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited in Christ. So to begin to know anything, you have to start with God and his presuppositions. Now, there's an objection that comes to this. Maybe it's, maybe it's what you're thinking of even. But some people will say, but wait a minute, Dr. Lal, I do know some non-Christians, and they do know some things. And that's true. That's right. We don't have the corner on the market of truth. Right. But my point is simply that that's because in their heart of hearts, they do know God. And God has hardwired some of his presuppositions, even into the mind of the unbeliever. So does that go back to the image of God being in, in all humans? That's right. God made us in his image, and the unbeliever can deny that, but he cannot escape that. That's right. He is made in the image of God. And for that reason, he is able to have some wisdom and knowledge, because he relies on biblical presuppositions. He just doesn't say that he's relying on. That's he doesn't acknowledge that fact. That's right. He's not grateful to God for, for relying on, on his presuppositions. But you see, what I'm going to argue is that only the Bible can make sense of those things that are necessary for knowledge. And the technical jargon for those are preconditions of intelligibility. Those are things that would have to be true in advance in order for knowledge to be possible. Huh. You see, in order for us to have knowledge of logic, logical reasoning, certain things would have to already be true. There would have to already be laws of logic, for example. So that's a precondition of intelligibility. Uh, for us to have knowledge of ethics, there would have to already be in existence laws of morality. And yes. so that's a precondition of intelligibility. And so those things would have to be true. Now, my point is that only the Bible can make sense of those preconditions of intelligibility. And therefore, my argument for the truth of the Bible is that unless the Bible is true, you can't prove that anything is true. Wow. And that's a different kind of argument than most people are used to. It's very powerful, and it's based on what the Bible itself says about the nature of knowledge. And so there are these things that we all rely upon to have knowledge, things like laws of logic, which gives us deductive reasoning, uh, things like uniformity in nature, which is that there's this orderliness to nature. I'm not talking about uniformitarianism, which is the idea that rates and conditions are constant. I don't believe that. It might be raining on Monday and sunny on Friday. Conditions change. But the laws of nature, there, there are these laws that are the consistent. The law of gravity and so forth. Exactly. Gravity works the change. same. They're not going to change. And yeah. God has promised us yeah. that. And we have only the promise of God, by the way, he's built, to guarantee he's that. He's built order into his creation. That's right. Yes. And we rely upon that. Yes. And we need that to do science, you see. So that makes sense. It stems right from God's word. Okay. For that matter, absolute morality. Even if these are a little abstract, uh, morality, I think, is easy to understand. People have thought about right and wrong, even if they haven't thought about laws of logic. But how could you have right and wrong in a chance universe? Now, if a humanist were sitting where I'm sitting, he would say to you that, that the community develop, de develops those, that it's a consensus of the community of right and wrong. How do you answer that? And say I would say absolute. that, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of evolutionists will try to respond that way. Yeah. And my, my, my question is, how do you make the jump from what is to what should be? In other words, okay, the community decides this is good. Why should I do what they say? Yeah. That's my they? question. Okay. Yeah. And uh, for that matter, there have been communities, like uh, the Nazis, for example, that have done some things that most of us would say are not very good. There have been a lot of societies do that. So That's there's right. a divine ought that That's everything right. else is coming from. That's okay. right. Only, okay. only by appealing to the biblical God can we have an absolute moral code. Okay, I hear you. And uh, if, we're just, if we're just chemical accidents, there's no, there's, there makes no sense. There's no law in a chemical yeah, accident. Absolutely. No. Now, my point is not that evolutionists don't believe in these things. On the contrary, my point is they do. And yet, on their worldview, they would have no foundation for that. Because how would these things make sense? So when my secular colleague says, oh, but, but I'm an atheist and I believe in laws of logic, I would say, well, if you're an atheist, you shouldn't. Because on that worldview, you can't have laws of logic. It's random chance. Exactly. How would you have logic? Yeah. How can you have laws? How can you have laws of logic in particular? Why would they have the properties they do? These things make sense only in light of the biblical God. And so we, what we find is that secular presuppositions will not support a worldview. The Bible describes them like sinking sand. And it's the, only the, the word of God that will stand up to rational scrutiny. And so when that sand dissolves away, the unbeliever is left in a rather peculiar position. He cannot stand on his own worldview. So what's he going to do? He's got one choice. He's going to stand on the Christian worldview. Now, he's not going to be honest about that, but that is what he's going to do. He's going to stand on Christian presuppositions. Non-believers will stand on Christian principles because they have to. They're going to have to use laws of logic. They're going to have to use principles of science. I mean, you couldn't get up in the morning without laws of logic. Imagine you wake up and you're in bed and you think, uh, I think I'll go take a shower. And then you think, well, wait a minute, maybe I'm already in the shower. Now, you don't do that. You use logic, right? I mean, you couldn't get up in the morning without laws of logic. So unbelievers, they have to live in God's universe, and therefore they have to play by God's rules if they're going to do that. And so they will use Christian presuppositions, but they'll deny it. And they'll say, no, no, that's not a Christian presupposition. That's, that's you know, laws of logic. That's neutral or secular. Laws of even. nature. Yeah, sure. And they'll have all these explanations of how they're not really standing on the Christian worldview, but they are. And so, really, you can think of this whole debate 
deba the debate over biblical creation, like a debate on the existence of air. Can you imagine two people arguing whether or not air exists? One would have to hold their breath while they argue. Well, Go you'd ahead. think, but in <laughs> fact, the person who's arguing no. for air would have to use you air, use wouldn't he? Yeah, having the argument. exactly. He'd have, to, he'd have to use air to make an argument against air. And so the very fact that uh, he's able to make an argument at all proves that he's wrong. Yeah. The fact that he can argue proves that his argument's wrong. And so it is with biblical creation. You see, the critic of the Bible has to use biblical presuppositions in order to argue against the Bible. And so the fact that he can stand there and make it and rant against God is only possible because God exists and God allows him to do it. And he's borrowing God's laws of logic and he's borrowing uh, scientific principles that, are, that, are, that God is responsible for in order to argue against the biblical God. That's an amazing argument. It really is. And there's no comeback from it. He, he might say, well, um, wait a minute. I, I don't need God to have laws of logic. I can reason just fine without God. I, I can believe in laws of logic. But that would be no different than the critic of air saying, wait a minute, you, you're telling me I need air to breathe? Well, that can't be because I don't even believe in air and I can breathe just fine. Right? <laughs> See, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not saying you have to profess a belief in air to breathe, but you do need air to, to breathe. Yes. And likewise, I'm not saying you have to profess a belief in the Bible to have knowledge, but the Bible would have to be true in order for you to have knowledge. And so what I want to show is that the unbeliever is standing on Christian ground, using Christian principles to argue against Christianity. And that can't, he can't possibly be successful with that kind of mindset. It's simply not going to work. And so what I would like to do then is uh, zoom in on, on at least one of these. If we, ha if we had more time, I'd do all three of them. But I want to show you that the laws of logic, their properties, they only make sense in a Christian worldview. Uniformity, I think we'll zoom in on morality because that's the one that most people are familiar with. And we'll see that when you examine uh, these worldviews, only the Christian worldview can make sense of an absolute moral code. The, uh, the secular worldview just can't do it. It doesn't make any sense. It's really fascinating, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say, but we do have to take a break. So we'll be back in just a minute. Don't you go away, and we'll look at the absolute morality and how it proves that we must be standing on Christian principles and on God's word. We'll be right back. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Jason Lyle, has a PhD in astrophysics. He is currently a speaker for the Institute for Creation Research, where he has authored several creation articles and books, including Taking Back Astronomy and Ultimate Proof. Book orders are being taken at 800-337-0375. Astronomy and physics have always been areas of special interest to Dr. Lyle. He enjoys viewing the night sky through the telescope and was very instrumental in developing the planetarium at the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Jason can be reached at Institute for Creation Research, P.O. Box 59029, Dallas, Texas 75229, or visit the website at icr.org. We are back with Dr. Jason Lyle, and we were talking about ultimate proof and the fact that even the evolutionist stands on Christian presuppositions as they're making their arguments. And you were going to take absolute morality and develop that for us. I'd like to hit morality because that's one that people have given more thought to, I think, than, than the others. But, you know, laws of logic, kind of abstract, scientific principles, a little bit abstract. But most people have thought about right and wrong. Yes. And so my point is that if God created this, right and wrong makes sense because he will have yes. the right to set the rules we're made in his image. We're not just rearranged pond scum. It, we're, we're responsible to God for our actions. That's right. And he will hold us accountable for our actions and so we have a very good reason to behave in a if particular way. there's a way. maker, there's a judge. That's right, yeah. absolutely. And so my question is, if there's no God, then why behave in a particular way? I mean, maybe it has survival value, but aside from that, uh, why would we have a moral code? And so, you know, if Adam is in your past, if God made you, then he owns you and he has the right to make the rules. Amen. But if ape is in your past, if you're just, again, rearrange pond scum, then you own yourself. There's, there's, you're not accountable to anybody other than yourself. Now, some people might say, that's right. Morality is relative. Everybody gets to make up their own moral code. And therefore, you can't go around telling other people what not to do. 
Don't and then impose and, your morality right. on me. That's yes. right. And when, when they say that, what are they doing? They're imposing their morality on you. You yeah. see, they're saying you they're can't right. do this. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so they're being inconsistent. And if you really press them to, you'll find nobody really believes in relative morality. But if I were to say hypothetically, if I were to pull a gun on you, Mr. Unbeliever, why shouldn't I pull the trigger? Go ahead and make my day. Give me a reason, right? Now, if he says, well, oh, you can't do that because you see there's this moral code that binds all of it. Well, then he's made my day because he's, he's shown that the, <laughs> that the Christian worldview is, uh, is true. If, on the other hand, he doesn't say anything at all, then I just pull the trigger and I win the debate that way. There's, there's no laws of logic in an evolutionary worldview. So if, as far as I can tell, there's no reason why you can't win a debate by simply shooting your opponent in the, uh, in the evolutionary worldview. Of course, I wouldn't do that, but that's because I have a Christian worldview. Thank you for adding that to <laughs> that's right. And I'm not encouraging any of our viewers no, to, that's right. to do that. So, uh, but anyway, that, that, that approach was used very effectively in the famous uh, Bonson-Stein debate. He used that very argument, and the atheist did not know how to come back from that. There is no comeback from that, really. Um, how do you decide right from wrong? That's what I want to ask my unbelieving friend. It, it doesn't matter if he has a secular worldview or another religious worldview. Unless he's appealing to the, the biblical God, he's really not going to be able to account for an absolute moral code, especially the one that, that we have. And, uh, he's not even going to acknowledge an absolute moral code. He may not. If he does, he, but he won't be able to give a good reason for, for it. it. That's right. If everything's right. by random chance, there's yeah. no reason for a moral code, for an absolute moral code. That's, That's right. right. Okay. And, I, and I thought, you know, I, well, I want to give people a, a preview of some possible responses that they might get. So what, yes. what, what might people say when you say this? Well, they, people might say, well, no, you don't need God. For, for good. Good is what brings the most happiness to the most people. So that's the, utili that's the right. utilitarian yeah. standard. And, you know, and, and maybe you're thinking, well, yeah, we, we should be concerned about the happiness of others, and that's true in the Christian worldview, you see. But if we're just chemicals, why should I be concerned about the happiness of chemicals? Just a, if happiness is just a chemical reaction in the brain, why should I try and achieve that particular chemical reaction as opposed to some other? Maybe pain, whatever brings the most pain to the most people is what's good. And see, they'd reject that. But my point is, why, what makes their opinion any better than any other opinion? And even here, they're subtly borrowing, borrowing on the Christian worldview, aren't they? Because they're saying, you don't need God to, de to determine good. Just do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I've heard that somewhere yeah, before, haven't you? Yeah, I like you? the guy that said that first. <laughs> That's okay. right. Yeah. So again, they're standing on the Christian worldview, arguing against the Christian worldview. They might say the moral code simply electrochemical impulses in the brain. I had a PhD neurologist tell me that one time. I was debating with him, and he said, uh, no, it's just the chemistry in your brain. I'm thinking, then why should I follow it? I've got chemistry in my stomach. Maybe I should use my indigestion to tell me right from wrong. You see, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. There's no reason why I ought to behave that way. And some people would say, well, laws of morality are conventions adopted for the benefit of society. And even there, you have to ask, well, who decides what benefit society? What benefits society? Again, the Nazis had some ideas about that that I think That's we would right. disagree with. Yeah. Just the idea, well, why should I follow those principles? Just because a group of people think that I should behave that way. Right. It doesn't make any sense. And so you see, and, I, and just to drive it home, consider an evolutionist who's outraged at seeing a violent murder on television. He says, How, that man shot that little girl. That's terrible. He should go to jail. And I'm, I'm glad he believes that. I do right. too. But my point is, in his worldview, why should he be angry? In his worldview, it's just one chemical accident getting rid of another chemical accident. What is the big deal, right? You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get angry right. at baking soda for reacting with vinegar. That's just what you're, chemicals you're, do. You're just bringing their, their position to its logical conclusion. That's right. That's what you want to do. You want to That's force right. them to be consistent with what uh -huh. they say they believe. He says human beings are just an animal. Well, you don't. You, the, the lion kills the antelope. You don't put the lion in jail and say, you better think about what you did. What, an, what one animal does to another is morally irrelevant. So if we're just animals, you can't have an absolute moral code. It simply doesn't make sense. And if you understand these principles, you can agree with the Apostle Paul and say, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Indeed, he has. I don't care if you're up against a, a PhD scientist. It doesn't matter. If he's not a Christian, his worldview is foolish, you see. I, I and so, um, that, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And so the way I like to put it is this, this verse, 1 Peter 3.15, which I think very succinctly sums up the way that we should defend the Christian faith. We're to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Now that means not that we're set apart. Sanctify means set apart. Right. Not from our hearts, but in our hearts. We're to make sure that Christ is at the core of our being. And uh, that's the key to doing apologetics. You said at the beginning of the program that it was ultimate proof, and I wouldn't know how to refute it when you get to the end. So well done, my friend. Well, thanks. Thank you. My friend, I am so thankful that you've come today to hear the truth that's been presented. And I hope that you'll take this into your heart and you'll see that it's not the Christian who doesn't have basic presuppositions to stand on, but in fact it's the evolutionists that must come to Christian presuppositions to even make their case. And so it is so exciting to know that God has revealed His truth to us. 
and that we can stand on His Word. I'm so thankful for uh, Dr. Jason being with us, and I'm thankful you're here. And I pray that we have reinforced your faith and built your confidence to stand on the truth of God's Word. Because in the end, my friend, it's God's view that He created you. And that should be your worldview too. Hope to see you again soon here on Origins. And until then, God bless you, my friend. this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1205, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.